Hello, everyone. Welcome to our bee club meeting of the uh, North Fraser Honeybee Club. I just somehow managed to make my minutes that I had on my screen disappear. So sorry about that. One moment. Um, we are having sort of like an open format, but now that we have Paul here, forgive my confusion because that was not on the uh, minutes. Paul's attending as a guest. For the, uh, okay, perfect. Not speaking. Perfect. So uh, we welcome everyone to the B Club. We have our uh, representatives of our executive this evening. We have Dan Raywin and we have Agneta. Uh, I am your meeting host, moderator. If you have any questions, please feel free to add them in the chat and we'll get to them um, if there's a speaker speaking uh, when they're done sharing uh, their um, expertise. Um, news. Did you want to do the uh, information from the BCHPA with their survey now, Dan, or did you want to do that later? Um, if we have it, we can do it now. Do you have it? I do not. Okay. I didn't see it either. We're not going to do that then. Perfect. Um, any other upcoming events that anybody would like to talk about or share with the group? You know, I have to say, I checked on the BCHPA website before this meeting just to make sure that there wasn't something that was, you know, coming in under the radar. But at this point, I don't see any events um, on that schedule um, leading to the end of the year. Mm -hmm. But why don't you ask Nuria about the survey? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I uh, made a little survey just to get to know beekeepers in BC and have their input. So if you could help me fill the survey, it's very short and you can find it online. I know Dan helped um, us uh, post that in Facebook and you will receive it shortly through the um, BCHPA newsletter. So if you have, or if you want to contact me directly by email, I'll just write my email in the chat. Sure. And I'll be happy to forward that to you. Thank you. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you're looking for in the survey? For sure. I want to have a general idea of what is the focus of the clubs and um, what beekeepers are doing in each region. And it's for me to get familiarized with you, uh, to see what is your aim, your main purposes, and where uh, most beekeepers are seeing themselves in future years. For example, if they are planning to grow their operation, which kind of operation are they looking for? Either honey, a queen and of production, uh, I know there are some interests uh, for, um, for the industry to, to grow in some aspects. So I want to know the side of the beekeepers and to have a map, a mind map of where you're at, get to know you and start planning for future um, educational and research projects that will benefit the beekeepers. So I want to make sure I'm including all your thoughts um, and, and your aims when, I'm, when we're planning that. Wonderful. That in a nutshell, that's what I'm trying to do with uh, 11 questions and also get to know you and, and, and uh, put faces to all the names and starting to get to know everybody. And at some point, request for your help to, uh, to be part of projects. Perfect. Um, forgive me if I missed it before, but what role do you have at the BCHPA? For sure. Um, so the, um, the new... A technology transfer program just got uh, started and the aim of this project is to connect the beekeeping industry with applied research to benefit the industry and create resources to uh, improve honeybee health and improve the industry in any way that uh, the beekeepers want to or feel that needs to be uh, uh, as, uh, or need assistance. So uh, the main role of TTP is to connect the bee industry with applied research and create resources for the industry. Thank you. Thank no you. Thanks. Um, are there, is there anything else upcoming that people would like to uh, bring forward now in regards to beekeeping workshops, anything that they have heard, anyone doing or going on? I guess uh, Christmas markets are kind of um, slower this year. Anybody involved with any Christmas markets? Maybe me. Oh, yes. Are you going to be selling honey there, Zdenka? 
uh, some honey, some candles. Uh, this is here in the Maple Ridge on Christmas market. So, uh, do you here, know? Because uh, this market is outside, and because uh, I like to go inside, I don't like to go. Of course. Do you want to give us the name of the market and the dates? Uh, this is um, a Christmas uh, market. They organize these uh, uh, small businesses in Maple Ridge every year, except last year. Last year, uh, because it was COVID and it was no market, but this year will be again. They have very nice uh, um, program. This is Christmas Carol and uh, really, really great. So doesn't matter, rain or shine. Rain or shine. <laughs> Do you know what days it's on, Zdenka? Uh, this is... Um, Oh, I, right now, I don't, this is um, middle of December from um, four, four o'clock p.m. to eight o'clock p.m. afternoon. I think middle of December. I'll let you know later because right now I have no paper here. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I, this time we have uh, planned a sort of open roundtable discussion. Uh, for anybody who would like to bring up any issues or anything that they have um, currently going on with their hives or any successes uh, that they're experiencing with their hives, having prepared the hives for wintering, um, how we fared perhaps with the recent rains or what beekeepers are doing to keep their hives from flooding, I suppose, with all the water that's coming down, keeping them dry. Did anybody manage to check on their hives um, after the torrential uh, wind and rain? Were they? I I talked uh, this afternoon with Loretta, and uh, her house is okay, but the driveway and all around is uh, flooded, and uh, half of the bee not completely, but a little bit because uh, she put it uh, hives uh, pretty high, but uh, still she's a little bit worried for a few one. I was on my bee yard and um, water is in the, in the ditch, no level with the road and for now is okay. So in that area, only, only all uh, meadows and um, field looking like lakes, lakes uh, uh, flooded completely all around. But usually this is um, mostly every winter. So when is a lot of rain coming. So Zdenka has a apiary on um, the, uh, I guess you could call it the east or the west side of Pitt Meadows, just at the Pitt River, uh, close to where it meets the Fraser. And it's pretty low in that area. The dikes are very high. I think they hit like 10 or 12 feet there. Um, so that particular area, which thankfully was not too impacted by the recent water. And Loretta, who Zdenka spoke of earlier, uh, used to be the bee club president as well as a member of the uh, North Fraser Honey Bee Club when she lived in the area. She's recently moved, well recently, I think it's like well over five years now, she moved to, um, why is it not, Hatsik, that's what it's called, Hatsik, and so it's just a bit difficult for her to commute for this club and the meetings here, so she has uh, is trying to get something off the ground out in Hatsik. I think there are three of them that meet regularly and um, discuss their bees and things that they're trying. Did anybody try Christian's fondant that he used uh, coming into the winter? Do you have any thoughts on that, Dan, how that went? Well, I guess the jury's still out. We'll see how the bees are in the spring. I'll say that the bees absolutely love that, the api pasta. Uh, you know, they go through it real quick. Um, you know, again, I still fed sugar water at the beginning of the fall. Uh, just because the pitch from you know, the West Coast bee supply was that they don't actually store it, they just eat it. So you know, I fed them the sugar water to build up the stores. But as we got into November, I put the Abbey Pasta on and they've already gone through, each hive has gone through a full, you know, pad of it, fed through a hole, you know, in the, in the, in the top cover. Um, and so far, so good. But again, we'll, we'll see how they are in the spring. All right, your thoughts on that, Paul? Do you have uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm a bit of the old school, so I suppose that's my gray hair for you. But the thing is, is that uh, uh, what I have often learned over quite a few decades that uh, 
big keepers sometimes um, that is no reflection on the fondant that you're talking about, but just in general that people, big keepers often uh, uh, are too, so we say, economical. It's a very nice diplomatic term to use for feeding their uh, carbohydrates in the fall to the bees. My old, uh, the, the old advice that I have always learned over the years is, you know what, you feed them as fast as you can, gore, let them gorge until finally they say, done. You cannot get more stuff into that colony, let's say in late September, October. You will never run out of fuel. The bees will never starve come next spring. But I have seen too many beekeepers often feeding uh, 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 using uh, frame feeders and they lose track as to how much actually is in that colony. Uh, I hate these frame feeders. You know what? An inverted bucket that you prepare that way is far quicker, it's far easier. Let them gorge in the shortest possible time in the fall season because they're still in a pseudo robbing mode. And that is actually, you want to take advantage of that so that you really gorge themselves, store it all, and you can go do your ice fishing or your Christmas preparations and don't worry about your bees. And they will not starve come next spring. Uh, I have actually a whole bunch of little topics that I wanted to, to raise. I mean, I don't know whether you are apt or ready for this, but uh, I, I like to drift from one thing to another. Uh, the floods, of course, just south of you are horrendous. I mean, as uh, what was already alluded to earlier, the uh, Animal Health Center, my office out there and the lab, that whole building is now shut off. It is closed because its entire basement was flooded with all the, um, the vehicles in there and the equipment. I mean, they have a write-off of, I think, 14 vehicles that are gone. Um, uh, storage facilities are gone. The, uh, the incinerator that they use for um, consuming, if you will, dead animals that they have uh, tested, uh, that thing is kaput. So there is an awful lot of stuff going on out there. So the labs are all closed, and therefore I have made appeals to the beekeepers to say, please do not send any samples in because the samples cannot even be stored because there is no mail or courier service delivery. So the stuff is going to be in decomposition somewhere in a storage facility at UPS or the courier service or our Canada mail. So don't, don't send anything in. Um, so far, the results are such that there have been some uh, damage uh, occurred in certain parts Fortunately, most beekeepers are wise enough not to put their bees in the Sumas Prairie Basin to begin with, simply because it is too wet, it is too humid, and that you compete with cows and everything else. So you don't want to have your bees in there in the first place. So the big commercial guys that come in from the prairies tend to uh, go to Alder Grove and Langley, where the elevation is a little bit higher and better drainage. Uh, in the South Okanagan, in the Similkameen uh, in, uh, Valley, there has been quite some damage. Quite a few colonies have been lost. That also involves some Alberta or some prairie beekeepers. And we are talking currently at a total number of about 1,500 to 2,000 colonies. Uh, again, that has to be all verified and documented and everything else. Earlier, Nuria was talking about, you know, about the TTP, the Tech Transfer Program. Uh, I, I, if, if I may, I'd like to put an, a, a better uh, context to all of this. Some of you, I don't see too many of you uh, that may have been around 30 or 40 years ago, but um, um, uh, the BC government or the, the in here in BC, we used to have a tech transfer program in the form of two uh, professional full-time employees, John Gates, that some of you remember. And the other one is, of course, Kerry Clark, who was the most recent past president of the BC HPA. Uh, they were basically having this kind of jobs that, uh, that, that, that we would classify today as a tech transfer program. But after the 1990s, when uh, the government decided to put in an awful lot of uh, restrictions on, on programs, uh, they considered our program too rich. 
in relation to the size of the industry, and they got rid of all of this. We were able to retain our inspectors, but not any of these uh, uh, project-oriented activities. Uh, we, I was told in very clear terms that the government was not a research in institution. So it is now coming to uh, going full circle, and I'm very happy to, uh, to see how this new development is taking place, is that since my kind of work has little to do with running projects. We just don't have the resources or the manpower or the know-how for that matter to carry these things out properly. At the same time, we fully recognize that uh, the beekeepers, small and large, are in need of having some applied research projects done to foster their, the development of their industry, to, to, to realize their long-term objectives. And I think it is wonderful that this development has now taken place and that Victoria is now supporting this TTP program for, for a few years anyway, and uh, so that uh, uh, these applied projects in direct cooperation with the beekeepers can be developed and can be implemented. So I hope that beekeepers will actively participate in this, in this program. And Nuria has been uh, siphoned off from Ontario. And you guys are very lucky. The beekeepers are very lucky to have uh, made it attractive enough for Nuria to give up what she was doing there at the University of Guelph and now come all the way out here to rainy, gray, depressing, coastal British Columbia in order to run some wonderful projects. So uh, again, uh, welcome Nuria for hopefully a very fruitful period of uh, work with the beekeepers. Um, some of you, and maybe none of you, because your operational size is not large enough, but we have every fall season um, production survey that we carry out online. Um, and you can visit it. You can you can even fill out a form. Uh, although it is now past the time that we still collect the data, uh, but uh, it is distributed to all the beekeepers with twenty five colonies or more. I think it was, and uh, we like to obtain information about their productivity, what they did or what they did not do, and how successful they were in their efforts to keep their bees productive in the last production year. And this year was particularly interesting because of these extraordinary weather conditions from heat waves and drought conditions and forest fires now to this, uh, this current situation. I mean, we're talking here about quite some extremes. Um, contrary to a widespread concern about these forest fires and the drought and the heat waves, many people had good reason. We were very worried that this was going to be a massive write-off and our bees are always a miracle workers because many beekeepers reported really good uh, honey yields and an excellent uh, production year. Uh, maybe not by volume so much, but in terms of the quality of the honey, uh, excellent. Many beekeepers have said it is fabulous honey uh, with very low humidity content. So it, is, it, is, um, it has been a good year. Now, all that data has been compiled in a very convenient one table kind of page and posted on the government website. And so you can study that, whether that is 2021, this year, or in previous years. For every year, we have one of those uh, standardized uh, 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 tables on an Excel spreadsheet, essentially. And uh, you can then make the comparisons and see what each of the regions of this province, what they have done. Uh, I hope that that is useful. Um, furthermore, uh, I just wanted to touch base on the fact that um, uh, we, the ministry has since for many years now, since 2015, we offered this webinar course free of charge. All what you have to do, if you visit the website, you have to send in an email and then you get onto the contact list and you get all kinds of information sent to you about course details. And the course will start on February the 5th uh, next year, and it is for four consecutive Saturday mornings. Now, for those of you who have to run your child, or maybe for some of you, your grandchild, to hockey practice and soccer games or whatever on Saturday mornings, each of those sessions are recorded, and you can view them at your leisure at any time for about two months. 
uh, for those that are dedicated enough and interested enough. So it's a free course. So some people have asked me for a while, why would the ministry offer a free course? Well, first of all, the ministry or the government doesn't sell anything. We are there strictly for the purposes of education in regards to this course. And uh, what we felt, uh, some of you may recall that years ago, we had for many, many years an introductory B course that we offered through Kwantlen, Kwantlen uh, in Langley. Uh, and similar courses were offered on Vancouver Island and in the, uh, in the Okanagan. The problem with that one is, is that you can only have maybe 25 or 30 people in the classroom. It's always in the evening, so people have to drive. So you have an, a location limitation, a class limit, uh, you know, and there's a cost involved. Uh, we decided that there are also a lot of taxpayers here in this province that live in remote areas and never have the opportunity for, an, for, an, for a course. And that is actually what uh, caused us to introduce or develop this, this webinar course. So it has been there since 2015. And uh, instead of having 25 students in board, on board last spring, um, I had a contact list of 1,300 people first. Not all of them took the course, I admit. And later on, we had to take the, offer the course a second time this last spring. And there were within three weeks, there were about 700 people on board. So it is certainly something that has generated interest. Of course, the price is right. <laughs> it doesn't cost you anything. Um, so I'm not catering or, or glamoring towards a huge uh, uh, in, um, uh, enrollment. It's just the purpose of it is, of course, we like to help beekeepers. But the underlying purpose is, is that we like to reduce the failure rate because there are so many people nowadays that are enamored with the idea of keeping bees and they have the naive idea when you just put a few boxes in your backyard and you dump a pile of bees in there, now you can go on the cocktail circuit and say, oh, I'm a beekeeper. Now, it doesn't work that way. And so we really try to reduce the losses of bees uh, by giving people a realistic picture as to what is involved to run bees and run them successfully. So that is the underlying purpose of it. So for those that are interested, by all means, uh, check it out and we can put you on the list and then you go from there. Last but not least, the Asian giant hornet. I just want to give you an update on that one. Um, uh, we have uh, we are going to shut down this 2021 survey that is uh, has been done here through the Fraser Valley or close to the border with the United States or with Washington State, and now it is getting so late in the season that there is no realistic uh, chance anymore that we will find any of these hornets. It's always possible, but very unlikely. So we might as well go home and then next spring, later in the spring, we'll set the traps out again. Um, uh, there was about a month ago an accidental, you might say an accidental find of a hornet found in a Japanese beetle trap. It's not supposed to go in there in the first place. It's, it's crazy why it ended up in there. But the specimen was so old and uh, uh, disintegrated uh, that it had been in there for a few weeks. Uh, let me explain. The Japanese beetle survey, which is done cooperatively between the federal government and the provincial government, they refresh or check these traps once every four weeks or once a month. Our survey with the Asian giant hornet, we refresh these traps every week. We check them every week. Um, where this creature was. Hello, sir. There is a young person uh, in. Uh, um, hello there. Good. You learned something about bees. Okay. The Asian giant hornet is, um, was not supposed to be there. And uh, the photograph indicated that it, was, uh, it had disintegrated and probably coincided with the latest nest eradication in Washington state uh, that occurred about uh, a half a mile away from the border with, uh, with, with us, with British Columbia. Um, the specimen was sent off to Ottawa for uh, proper identification, although the photograph was pretty compelling. Uh, the dimensions were such that it was only 23 millimeters, which basically precluded uh, uh, that it was a queen. We, it was probably just a worker, 
uh, that came probably from one of these eradicated nests. So the DNA sequencing is being, uh, I see here some interesting tests. Test. Uh, anyway, uh, the, um, the DNA sequencing will be taking place to determine its relatedness to uh, the eradicated nests in Washington state. And uh, uh, so uh, we anticipate that that is very closely related. In other words, that all these uh, incidences in, uh, in close to the border in Washington state have all originated from one single introduction a couple of years ago or so. Um, so next year we will do it again. Um, and the nice side of all this story is that in on Vancouver Island, they have not been able to uh, offer any verified uh, uh, sightings or collections of specimens since September of 2019. And that means that now well over two years of absence of, or yeah, absence of these uh, Asian giant hornets, we are now at the cusp of declaring Vancouver Island and Gulf Islands free of the Asian giant hornet. So that's basically what I wanted to share with you. So any questions, ideas? Go ahead. I just uh, want to add that I have done Paul's course a couple of years in a row, uh, the free one that happens in February. And uh, I always learn something new and I love his little model that he has that he pulls out the little mini hive. So it's a great course if you're thinking of just even going back to the basics. Thank you. Thank you. I admire your perseverance. <laughs> I always am reminded again, oh yeah, it was in that stage that you failed, right? <laughs> Just because races aren't won in the first corner, they're certainly lost there. And going back to beginner courses, we're always reminded that basics, Good. basics. So if I may ask Dan, where are you? I don't see you anymore. Oh, uh, he disappeared, I suppose. But, uh, oh, there you are with the, with the fondant. Uh, you know, how many colonies have you got treated with this? Nine. Pardon? Nine. Oh, nine. So what is really valuable if you uh, now sharpen your pencil and then next spring you, nice, you write a nice little report what your experience was, good or bad, and share it with beekeepers, not just locally, but submit an article, a short, nice little concise article to the BCHPA newsletter and say, hey, this was my experience. This is the way I did it. And this is my experience. Um, I'm, I'm a strong uh, believer in the, in the, in the, in the uh, bee scene uh, publication, which compared to other publications across the country is one of the best provincial newsletters. Uh, and that is not because I contribute to it. Please uh, recognize this, uh, but it's just simply, uh, it's a lot of information and I'd like to see more beekeepers share their experiences with fellow beekeepers. Um, you know, I can always fill the page, it doesn't matter, but it is good for beekeepers to communicate with other beekeepers. So if you have this project, you know, think about publishing it or write an interesting article about it. Just a suggestion. Yeah, it's a great Great uh, suggestion. Is there a, a, a place where beekeepers can submit articles? And, and maybe it's something I can follow up on for the entire club, because I'm sure I'm not the only author, uh, you know, or, or person that's, that's feeding their bees, happy pasta, or those things in the club. Well, in the second, in the second uh, uh, page, uh, or inside the main flap out there, you have there the editor, uh, which is Heather Sosnowski. She is, she is a beekeeper up in Smithers of all places, and um, she does a marvelous job. Uh, so uh, you just sent an email to Heather. Of course, Heather does have what we call the editorial prerogative. She can deny something or say, well, you better modify this. She does that to me all the time, by the way. So you might as well be subjected to it as well. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's a marvelous publication and it is published for beekeepers. So... You might as well be a create part of the creation of it. So good. And we invite any members that are there uh, tonight listening that are trying something new to 
always consider writing something. Um, we do have a member who does like to write blogs about her beekeeping experience, so we'll have to let her know as well. Okay. Yes. Trying always something new. Um, did anybody have any questions right now? All that information that both Noria and Paul has to have just shared. Um, anything that you would like to know about at this time? Well, I'll just share my, my journey and maybe others want to follow. You know, I, I, I came into this uh, beekeeping season with, with six hives. Um, and I, you know, yeah. when I went out of the season, it's my, the end of my third uh, beekeeping uh, cycle, if you will, uh, with nine. Um, I've, I've decided up until now, I've done single brood. Um, I've decided this year to kind of do a mix of double brood and single brood to see what works best for me in my area. Um, and we'll, 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 and I also did uh, one nuke as well, one nuke colony I'm going to try and overwinter as well. So just, you know, I, I feel like I've got my rhythm and I'm just going to try a few different things to see if I can sort of hone my practice. That, that's where I'm at. And I'm also selling honey online. I'm having a heck of a time finding 255 mil hex jars, um, which I usually sell a ton of to realtors as gifts and such, but uh, it's been tough this year. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Did you want to type your uh, web address in the um, in the chat for people? Sure. Anybody else? Raywin, do you think that's a course that Paul is taking something that you would like or be interested in? I have taken it uh, once a few years back. Okay. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it very much. Not discouraged, eh? No, no, I just keep coming back for more. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Dan, is there um, anything you wanted to add at this time? Sorry, I cut somebody off. Or was that directed at me? I was just going to make a comment about the fact that uh, we are currently quite involved also, which probably doesn't affect any of you too much, but um, uh, you may have heard this through the grapevine that uh, the blueberry industry is in, well, I don't want to see in trouble, but they feel that they are uh, struggling. Uh, as you know, in the last 20 to 25 years, this, this industry has expanded from maybe in a total of 5,000 acres of cultivation to, uh, to between 25 and 30,000 acres uh, under cultivation. And with that, of course, comes a huge demand um, uh, of uh, pollinating insects. And the irony of it is that uh, um, uh, according to long-term texts, uh, that is nothing that uh, we figured out, but it has been well known that the recommended placement of colonies per acre on mature stand of high boost blueberry is about two uh, colonies per acre. Now, if you would have 25,000, let's say, of mature stands and another few thousand of immature stands, uh, and if you follow that uh, that recommendation, you're talking about a need of something in the order of 50,000 colonies uh, for meeting the pollination requirements of this industry. Well, guess, uh, we have currently a grand total of an estimated 62,000 colonies in the entire province. And many colonies uh, are operated uh, on a small scale by beekeepers who have no particular interest to uh, chase uh, pollination contracts because they're too small or they don't have the transportation or the, uh, the you know, uh, the organizational uh, uh, structure in place to, to meet these demands. So uh, there is a high dependency of the annual import of honeybee colonies from the prairie provinces. And 20 years ago, it were prairie beekeepers who brought their colonies in primarily for the purposes of, of wintering successfully uh, because the bees will have not only a better wintering success, but they have a much earlier start in the season and could therefore build up and, and be stronger by the time they would go back into the prairie. 
Um, so, uh, and in the early stages, some of them saw the potential or the opportunity to uh, to say, from gee, you know, I pick up a pollination contract and it pays for all my trucking expenses. And as a result, it is kind of a self-paying idea of bringing my bees all the way down to southern British Columbia. This has grown enormously because there are still some 40,000 colonies that are brought in from the prairies every fall season. And they are wintered in the South Okanagan and some of them in the Creston area and many of them, of course, here in the Fraser Valley. Not all of them are uh, contracted for pollination, uh, but a fair number. And then a few years ago, uh, uh, prairie beekeepers started to complain about the uh, uh, poor condition that these colonies were in after they were in blueberry pollination. And some of them even reported that by the time they got them back into their home province, that they never really picked up, that they stayed weak and that they never really became full-fledged honey-producing colonies. So that was kind of the beginning of a decline, the interest of commercial beekeepers to service the, uh, the blueberry industry. So we are currently trying to turn this around by getting a more structured uh, 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 relationship in place between the group of beekeepers and the group of blueberry growers and see whether or not there is a certain element of commonality, both in pricing as well as in management uh, to secure uh, pollination uh, services for this, uh, for this very important uh, uh, industry. Over and beyond the actual honeybee business of providing pollination services, um, uh, the, indus, uh, the, bee, uh, the, um, the blueberry growers have finally come around and started to have a greater interest in a project uh, uh, to, uh, or to rely more heavily on native pollinators, particularly bumblebees. And the irony of it is, is that uh, Jackie Bunsey, maybe some of you remember her, she was the former apiary inspector here in the Fraser Valley for many years in the 1990s. Um, and early uh, 2000s, um, uh, Jackie and I uh, carried out a BC Blueberry Council supported project to enhance blue, uh, bumblebees in blueberry fields. Um, that project was so interesting in that it had quite a bit of money. We never spent the money except a couple of thousand dollars because we came to the conclusion very quickly where the problem lies. And the problem for blueberry or for bumblebees was not so much to be in blueberries, but after blueberries, there was basically a, a permanent dearth period. Uh, we proposed at that time, look, set the dinner table for these native pollinators after the blueberry has bloomed and flowered, and then you feed them through wildflowers so that they can become very reproductively successful by the end of the summer season. Well, many of the blueberry growers didn't see any uh, value in this because they said, well, I'm not going to sacrifice six feet by 30 feet worth of land to put in these flower beds because I can put 10 bushes out there. Uh, not realizing that they will end up relying more heavily on honeybee colonies for pollination and, and have less biodiversity in their own fields. Now, finally, they start to turn around, and this is maybe a wonderful project that will, uh, uh, that will teach them that it is worth to have greater biodiversity in their fields, and particularly a greater uh, 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 pollinator fauna in their, in their local habitat. So that is the second part of this entire project that we are undertaking with the Bleasy Blueberry Growers. So I just want to fill you in on that. We hear a lot about um, blueberries and many of the old beekeepers that uh, have now retired and moved on from the North Fraser Honeybee Club provided local pollination, Sedanka and Vlad being um, an yeah. area that definitely did that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Loretta also, um, and they have commented on even how difficult it is for them to have their own hives recover if they do. Um, with the blueberry pollination. So definitely a topic of interest in our club. Did anybody have any questions about that that they would like to ask at this time? 
Are there currently any um, projects or studies going on? Because it's been proven that the um, the wildflower strip would benefit the um, bumblebees. Um, but has there been any recent development or activity in that field? Uh, yeah, well, uh, yes, um, there is an active project going on in Delta, for example, with the uh, with a number of researchers uh, to essentially address this issue of a greater uh, uh, pollinator fauna or greater diversity in of the pollinator fauna in in certain habitats uh, through the creation of riparian zones and putting in attractive uh, bee forage uh, uh, in or near these fields. Uh, it's, uh, if, if we look at the biology of these pollinators, it is interesting. Honeybees are long distance flyers. These girls can tell each other inside of the hive, you know, you fly X numbers of meters or numbers of units of energy and you get to a food source that is in this and this location. But bumblebees don't do that. They are not, so we say, evolved enough to be able to speak with each other. So they come out of the nest and they are they cannot afford to fly, uh, you know, a couple of miles. They just cannot do that because they, they have trouble to come back again. They have not neither the numbers nor the memory capacity to do that. So bumblebees, for example, are short distance flyers. I mean, short distance, I mean, maybe 500 to 1,000 feet, and that's about it. Uh, these blueberry plantings are often the problem is that you typically have here the limitations of a monocultural practice, you know, and after the, the, uh, doing the flowering of blueberries, that is, that is what they call an, uh, that is feast, uh, an, an enormous amount of food for these, for these, for these uh, pollinators. But then after that, there is an essentially an, a permanent dearth period. The, the dinner table is no longer there for them. And they are much more confined to the local habitat. Their biology is also such that these colonies are expanding very slowly if there is food available over the course of the summer season. And it is not until late July and August when they go actually through this reproductive stage of having reproductives develop virgin queens and males that will then mate. So if you have a nest that struggles to stay alive after blueberry pollination has taken place and it kind of putters through the entire and struggles throughout the entire summer season, then really it will never produce a lot of reproductives at the end of the summer. So if you put more of the dinner table consistently, not in one year, but consistently, you will have, statistically, you will have a larger number of nests that are actually successful of producing a fair number of reproductives at the end of the season. And that is kind of, it's a long-term project. It is not a flash in the pan kind of idea. This has been proven very successful in many environments, not just here in North America, but studies have been done in California, uh, where clearly there is a much better fruit set of an area where you have greater pollination, pollinator diversity, um, while the total numbers of, of, of pollinating insects may not have changed. If you have only one insect, let's say the honeybees, and you have a thousand bees per acre, let's say you have an okay fruit set, but if you have the same a thousand pollinators consisting of a number of different species, your fruit set is far, far better. And that is why it is so important to, uh, to enhance this practice rather than having these monocultural practices taking place. So. Uh, well, it, I'm sorry, they are thinking about going for native pollinators, but not importing bombus from other um, locations. Well, we are very reluctant of importing them from other locations. And the reason is, is that um, uh, there used to be commercial production of Bombus occidentalis. I, I don't want to start talking here too much about Bombus compared to what the beekeepers here are wanting to hear about honeybees. But uh, so the, the greenhouse industry used Bombus occidentalis in the 1990s, and that was very successful. Uh, this is a native pollinator here on the West Coast. And then in 1990, 
1999, uh, the situation collapsed because the both the principal suppliers of this in Eastern Canada in their laboratories where they produce these Bombus occidentalis, they could not get a handle on a serious outbreak of Nozema. This Nozema, by the way, is a different species uh, of but it is the same genus. And eventually it became so critical out here that the big multi-million dollar greenhouses of tomatoes couldn't get the bumblebees in, couldn't get pollination done. They had to hire people to do nothing but hand pollinating these uh, these uh, these uh, hothouse tomatoes. Well, you can imagine what kind of job that was. And so they negotiated, the industry negotiated with the government to be permitted to bring in impatience, Bombus impatience. Now, Bombus impatience is from Eastern North America and is not native out here. We put in a whole bunch of uh, uh, safety uh, measures, knowing very well that the, that was only going to be successful only part of the way. Uh, and of course, since that time, Bombus impatience has escaped and has apparently established itself here on the West Coast. The point I'm trying to get at is, is that um, uh, growers can always get, well, if they have native species that they can use in field settings, they could do that, but that costs money as well. Uh, we are promoting the idea from, you know, if you set up a system where you can enhance native pollinators, then you can have both honeybees and native pollinators, wild pollinators, and enhance your entire environment for for your crop. So, but there is a possibility that if there is a native pollinator that they can produce commercially, uh, that may be another possibility. So, there are two species that currently are being considered by the principal suppliers, BioBest and Coppert. Uh, one of them is called uh, Bombus uh, Vosnesensky, and the other one is Huntai. Uh, Bombus Huntai. Um, but of course, these things are expensive. They have to be flown over, uh, air freighted to the West Coast, and uh, it's not cheap. So. And, and why are there no, why is there no lab in BC that's breeding bumblebees? How about the Benjamins? Money. <laughs> Uh, you know, Ontario, particularly in Leamington, uh, that area, that is a hotbed for all kinds of greenhouse industry, whatever, and, and for many parts of uh, the United States as well. Uh, yes, we think we are very important out here, of course, but in the larger scheme of things, we're not. Um, and, and so it's, it was not cost effective. For them, it's far easier. These laboratories are very expensive to operate. Um, and... Uh, uh, considering so many other expenses, such as land and uh, expenses and whatever, these companies thought, hey, it is far easier just to ship them over by freight. And they still do. Yeah. Anyway, this is a so totally different story outside of honeybees, but... Uh, <laughs> so. We love tangents. <laughs> We love tangents. We actually had a speaker come on a couple of weeks ago, and uh, weeks, probably a month, uh, and spoke about mason bee um, sort of farming in order to help with that uh, intensive growing period for fruit and vegetables, and then that uh, you can time it so that they are pollinating at around the time that the flowers need the pollination. So, so that was quite fascinating because not all the individuals who come to our meetings are interested in just being honey beekeepers. Yes, uh, Bombus, uh, or oh, sorry, not Bombus, Osmia bees, uh, they certainly hold a um, um, promise in the United States, in the Southern States, where you have more favorable climatic conditions. They have done that on a much larger scale. The problem that we have had always with blueberries is, is that um, uh, it's a numbers game. Uh, and, and stand of high bush blueberries that is different from the low bush blueberries in Eastern Canada, but high bush blueberries here in, in the West Coast, uh, they, it's estimated that they produce approximately four and a half to five million flowers per acre. And if you have just a small number of osmia bees or bumblebees for that matter, uh, it, it just doesn't add up. 
uh, if you have, uh, yeah, we they really need honeybees in order to make up f- for the numbers. Uh, even though honeybees are not that efficient in pollinating blueberries compared to, let's say, bumblebees. Bumblebees are far more effective in it, but you don't have the numbers to add to 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 make them as the sole pollinator in this crop. That's the that's the that's the big problem. To illustrate it, you know, a native uh, uh, nest, uh, let's say a wild nest of bumblebees, maybe let's say in April, May, when the blueberries are flowering, you may have a nest to be optimistic uh, that may harbor, let's say, 100 individuals. I doubt it, but let's say just to be optimistic. And let's say that they are hyper uh, uh, active and 50% of the entire population goes out to pollinate. So that's 50 bees. 50 bumblebees, and here you have, I don't think there are too many acres or too many fields that comprised of only one acre. Most of them are five acres, 10 acres, or 40 acres. So let's say there's one acre. So you have 50 bees flying around out there. Ah, It's kind of lousy. If you look at a honeybee colony and we use the standard pollination unit, I don't want to go into that now, but let's say the standard unit, you're talking about 12,000 to 15,000 bees. And let's say because our honeybees are fair weather flyers, they don't like the lousy weather. Uh, and let's say that only at the best of circumstances, 5% of the 12,000 or 15,000 uh, go out uh, to pollinate at any one time, forage, forage at any one time. That means 750 of these bees are out there flying compared to the 25 bumblebees. But according to the recommendations, you don't put in one colony. No, you put in two colonies per acre. So you deal now with 1,500 of those honeybees foraging in the blueberry field versus the 25 bumblebees. That's where the problem comes in, at least for the growers. Anyway. Maximum crop yield. That's what it is. Maximum crop yield. Um, do we have any other questions or comments at this time? Anybody try anything new? Uh, we are approaching 8.30, so we are looking to sort of wrap up the meeting around then. So we're, we would love to have a few last minute questions if anybody has any. All right. Um, the next item on our um, meeting is uh, a sort of a general meeting adjournment. And then if we could ask that um, the executive just stay on for a few minutes. Um, We would like to thank uh, both Nuria and Paul for joining us this evening and sharing their expertise. Of course, along with our other guests that we've had here this evening, John and uh, Paul, Helen, Stanka, well, she's a member of our crew and Bonnie, thank you so much for joining. Any last minute questions for those of you that are going to be leaving the meeting at this time? I just wanna quickly say thank you to Paul and Marina as well. Um, It was fantastic. I I learned a lot tonight that I wasn't expecting to learn, uh, but it was fantastic. So so thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Always a pleasure to have expertise in the room sharing wisdom. Um, Thank you all for joining this evening. Uh, We really appreciate it. Uh, Maybe we can have you in the future. Um, Next month, uh, we don't have a bee club meeting. It is uh, usually a sort of a Christmas gathering. Um, We're not sure with the new variant out what exactly that's what what it's going to look like. So please check the websites and your emails for details. Um, In January, we come up to our AGM where we will also be hosting a speaker. And uh, I think it's either January or February, we have a a very interesting beekeeper out of Burnaby who's sharing uh, nuke making. He runs a a nuke making business on the side of beekeeping, does sell honey and everything else as well. But he tends to focus on how to make nukes. So um, that's what will be coming up in the new year. Thank you all for joining and uh, we'll be in touch, of course, by email, Facebook, website. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Meet you all. Thank you, Miriam. Good luck with your survey. We look forward to taking it. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks.